So the theme of our weekend together is the foundation of Buddhist practice, which is the title of this book. And this book is volume two in a series um, of the Dalai Lama's uh, teachings. And the series is going to be probably nine or ten volumes at the end. We're not sure yet. Um, the first volume was called Approaching the Buddhist Path. And then this volume, The Foundation of Buddhist Practice. The third volume is Samsara, Nirvana, and Buddha Nature. So those three are out in print. In October, November, volume four, Following in the Buddhist Footsteps will be out. And then next August, Volume 5, in praise of great compassion, will be ready. And then more are following. So, uh, in doing this, uh, His Holiness, uh, you know, was quite strong about me being a co-author. I wanted just to be the editor, but he wanted me to be co-author. And he also gave me permission to uh, rearrange some of the topics according to how it seemed best uh, to explain the Dharma to non-Tibetan audiences. Because that was the purpose of this. That's how this whole project started. So, uh, I don't know about you, but when I came into Buddhism, you know, the first thing I heard was about uh, precious human life and I should be so happy that I'm not in the hell realm and the hunger ghost realm and the animal realm and I'm going, mm, okay. But how do I know rebirth exists? Yeah. And uh, so we really need, as people who didn't grow up in a Buddhist culture, we need a lot of background material before we start on the uh, conventional stages of the path. So volume one and part of volume two provide a lot of background material. And then in volume two, we also start getting into the uh, gradual path. But some of the topics, the order of the topics, are kind of knowers. It talks about the need to use reasoning and what is a syllogism how you make an, a logical argument. So it's, uh, in some ways, a more advanced chapter for people at the beginning. But what it does is it lets us know that um, Buddhism is based on reasoning, on logic. It isn't just based on faith. And this is one of the things that really impressed me when I first met the Dharma in 1975 is the Lama said, you don't need to believe anything we say. <laughs> I'm not good. Because until then, I had been, bar been bombarded with people telling me the truth with a capital T. And of course, all these truths were different. And when I asked questions, I couldn't get reliable answers. And then at the end, basically, the answer was, don't ask questions. <laughs> yeah, but that didn't sit very well, you know, because we grew up in a culture where we're used to questioning. And we learned science as kids, where you question and you test things out. And so we're coming to the Dharma in that way as people with uh, prior education. And His Holiness really realizes that. Yeah. So, you know, we, we have this whole discussion of non-deceptive knowledge. Uh, last year I was teaching this volume at the Abbey, and 
uh, this chapter is very difficult. But everybody really got into it because there were a lot of exercises in, to, in it. And so I said, okay, at mealtime, you know, you do the exercises. And even beginners got into it, wouldn't you say? Yeah. yeah? So it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Then um, the book goes into the basis of the self, the body and mind, and all the way that we categorize phenomena in Buddhism. Yeah. Also very useful, but it usually doesn't come until later. Yeah. Then, okay, chapter um, four and five are about uh, relating to a spiritual mentor. So this is often translated as guru devotion, which I don't think is a very good translation. The Tibetan is Lama Tenpa. So Lama means a spiritual mentor, and Tenpa means to rely upon, to depend on. So how to depend on a spiritual mentor, how to make ourselves a qualified student, so that the relationship can really uh, function to lead us to awakening. Okay, so it's not a practice of, devo of just blind faith, um, which we often get when we hear guru devotion. We get this idea, you surrender everything to the guru, including your wisdom. And Lama Yeshi, yeah, <laughs> was totally against that when people would come to Lama and, you know, say, uh, what do I do, and what do I do, and where do I go, and what do I do? And I remember one time he sat, he stood there and he said, the next thing they're going to ask me where to go pee-pee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? So he kept saying, develop your own wisdom, dear. Mm -hmm. So, I had doubts when doing the book where to put this, these chapters about relating to the spiritual mentor. Because in some ways, it makes sense to put them at the end, because when you learn the teachings and you appreciate the teachings, then it's very easy to appreciate the person who taught you. Yeah. But then I thought, you know, this could be nine or ten volumes later, and several years later, and in the West there's a whole lot of confusion about what it means to relate to a spiritual mentor. So I thought, mm, better to put these chapters now, okay, so that people can, uh, you know, go in with a clearer perspective. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama, has a very uh, special way of describing this. It's based on the Buddhist teachings, on Tsongkhapa's teachings. But His Holiness is very practical. Yeah, extremely practical. And he's willing to talk about all the different aspects of relating to a spiritual mentor. So those two chapters are quite interesting. And uh, I really recommend them to you. Is chapter four and five. Then, chapter six, how to structure a meditation session. So that's useful at the beginning of our practice. Then, chapter seven, we go into the body, mind, and rebirth because the teachings uh, for <coughs> us who didn't grow up in a Buddhist culture, rebirth is one of the um, topics that uh, we really need to think about and we need some really solid explanation of how that works. So some of that is in volume two, some of it is here, uh, I mean in volume one, and some of it is here in volume two. So really thinking about what is the mind, what is the body, how are they different, what is going on uh, when we talk about rebirth. Okay. That leads us then to the essence of a meaningful life, which is, uh, you know, the discussion of uh, precious human life, which, as most of you know, you know, comes very early in the uh, the usual long rim. So we talk about uh, 
you know, the essence of a meaningful life, uh, the value of having a precious human life. And then we get into um, looking beyond this life. So talking about death, what actually death means, and then a little bit about the different realms. Okay? Unlike Pabonka Rinpoche's um, <laughs> yeah, some people are laughing already. Uh, you know, his liberation in the palm of your hand, where this section on the hell realm is pretty hefty, and most of us are going, wait a minute here. You know, the religion I grew up in talked about the hell realm, and that's one of the reasons I left. <laughs> and now I'm coming here, and they're talking about it again. And, you know, is this the same old, same old? Okay. So His Holiness doesn't emphasize the, the lower realms a lot. Okay. Um, he emphasizes much more... Uh, you know, we talk about the stick and the carrot. Yeah, he emphasizes the carrot approach. Yeah, so you lead the donkey by having a carrot, and the donkey follows it, instead of you following the, um, the donkey and beating it with the stick, okay, threatening it. And in fact, His Holiness, he really likes telling this story of... Um, I guess it was an Amdo somewhere, I'm not sure. But uh, one monk went to see the abbot of a monastery there. And his attendant said, well, the abbot isn't here now. And the monk said, well, you know, what's going on? Where is he? And the, the attendant said, he's out scaring the lay people. <laughs> 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 His Holiness then. That meant that he was out teaching about the lower realms and how if you don't get your life together, you're going to be born in them. And His Holiness was very adamant this is not the way we should teach and that in no way should the Dharma be teachings be seen as threatening people. Okay? That's not the idea. You know, especially because in Buddhism there's no creator god or manager of the universe who dishes out rewards and punishments or who threatens people with eternal damnation Yeah, if you don't follow the rules correctly. The whole idea of karma, which we'll get into in a minute, is really based on cause and effect. Yeah, so there's no threat in this. And His Holiness was really saying, you know, we should not frighten people like by speaking of this. Okay. So we talk about, uh, you know, death, a little bit about the lower realms, very little bit. And then in the usual long rim tradition, yeah, refuge is the next topic. Now, in talking with some of the other Western Buddhist teachers who are my friends, we find that when teaching in the West, when you talk about refuge, people get really confused. You know, when refuge is introduced at this point, right after precious human life and death and a little bit about the lower realms, then refuge you know, and you're talking about the Buddha and all these far out qualities, yeah, and and how can we establish the existence of these qualities? Because again, they're just spelled out as wonderful qualities and we're told to believe, yeah? So we have to remember that the Lam Rim was written for people who were already Buddhist and essentially people who had gone through the whole philosophical study program in the monasteries, who now wanted the essential points to meditate on, now that they finished their education in the monasteries. So that's how the Lam, who the Lama was initially directed towards. It wasn't directed towards people like us. 
okay, who come from a different culture, and so on, okay? So, uh, you know, yeah, refuge can be a very confusing topic for people. And, and then in discussing, you know, with the other uh, Western Buddhist teachers, uh, what people want to know after they hear about precious human life and death is karma. Okay? So if I'm going to be reborn and my rebirth is going to depend on my actions in this life and in previous lives, yeah, and at karma simply means action, then, you know, how does karma work? And what are, you know, virtuous actions? What are non-virtuous actions? When I make mistakes, how do I purify them? Because there's a lot of things I've done in the past I don't feel good about. Um, you know, I want some way to kind of resolve and make peace with the past and put these things down. So rather than uh, make refuge the next topic, we make karma the next topic. The reason the Tibetans have refuge as the next topic is after precious human life, then it, your life isn't going to last forever. There's death. There's the possibility of being born in the lower realms. And so you need help. Who do you turn to help to? The Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And when you have faith in the three jewels, then when you hear the teachings on refuge, or on karma, you'll have more confidence and faith in those teachings because you have confidence and faith in the three jewels. Okay, But for us, many of us anyway, hearing about the qualities of refuge, which are adila, you know, and sometimes it's hard for us to relate to them, you know, that that doesn't help at that point. Um, we are, we want to know, okay, cause and effect, and what karma is, is a system of cause and effect. We grew up with a scientific education based on cause and effect. So we want to know, okay, this is a system of cause and effect. How does it work? And since it's, uh, you know, I'm embedded in it, and it's going to influence what I experience, I need to understand this. So that's why uh, in volume two, the last one, two, three, yeah, three chapters are um, an extensive explanation of karma and its effects. Refuge comes in volume four much later on, okay? Because in Volume 3, we talk about the Four Noble Truths, the Four Truths, yeah? And the, um, you know, the uh, first truth, the truth of dukkha, or suffering, suffering's a horrible translation, uh, truth of the origin or cause of our unsatisfactory situation. And then truth of cessation and truth of the path. True cessation and true path, the last two of the four truths, are the actual uh, Dharma refuge. So when we study the four truths in volume uh, three, then it follows very easily to talk about refuge in volume four, okay? Because of, you know, the Dharma refuge is the last two of the four truths. And then the Sangha refuge are the ones who have realized uh, at least some of the two paths and two cessations, and Buddha has fully realized them. And so in that way you establish the existence of the three jewels and the qualities of the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And you have much more knowledge about Buddhism before you get into all the qualities of the Buddha. Okay, 
Now that's why refuge is in uh, volume four. Yeah. And volume four also contains the three higher trainings of ethical conduct, concentration, and wisdom. Yeah. Because those three higher trainings, when we talk about true paths, the fourth noble truth, they are the true paths. Okay? So it's a different way of uh, sequencing the teachings in a way that I think helps us understand how certain topics fit together. Okay? So this weekend, we're focusing on the foundation of Buddhist practice. So I thought what I'd do is uh, go into the chapters on karma. Yeah, because this is something that's very interesting for people. Uh, so there's actually a lot to talk about in karma. Um, we won't get through all of the chapters. What I thought is uh, to talk about, you know, different points, uh, some more briefly, some more extensively, and then um, leave it to you to read the rest, okay? Simply because of the time factor, okay? Okay, so I thought I'd read a little bit sometimes from the book and then also uh, comment, okay? So, uh, where's 231? So, um, like I said, karma is a system of cause and effect. Yeah? It's not the only system of cause and effect. Okay? Not everything is due to karma. Okay? We have biological cause and effect, chemical cause and effect, psychological cause and effect, Physics, cause and effect, you know, um, there's many <coughs> systems of cause and effect. Karma is one of those, okay? So karma means action, and it's referring um, to our volitional actions, actions done with an intention, okay? So this really points us to understanding our mind and to looking at what are our intentions for doing what we do, saying what we say, thinking and feeling what we think and feel. Okay. So it's, uh, when you learn karma, it's not uh, some external system that is being superimposed on us of this is what you do to be a good boy or girl, and this is what you do if you're a bad boy and girl. So you better be a good one, or else. <laughs> okay, this is that kind of, you know, Sunday school understanding is not part of the Buddhist explanation. Like I said, there's no creator, there's no manager, nobody's dishing out rewards and punishments. Okay? The whole system of uh, designating what is virtuous and non-virtuous is because the Buddha, with his uh, exceptional powers, was able to see when sentient beings experienced happiness, these were the causes, and he called those causes virtue. Okay, And these are long-term causes, not what happened five minutes before you have the effect. When sentient beings experience non-virtue, you know, the cause, I mean, when they, they experience uh, suffering and misery, the causes of those were called non-virtue. Yeah. So the Buddha didn't say, this is virtue and not at virtue because I made up the rules. Okay. He is just describing the natural function of how our mind works and how our mind... Uh, brings forth our experience, you know, 
how the, the mind in many ways is the creator. There is no external permanent uh, creator yeah, or absolute creator. And in fact, there's no beginning to the universe. And if you say, but there has to be a beginning, yeah, there has to be a beginning. Okay, do you remember in math class when you learned about the number line? Okay, so you had zero and then plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four. Ad infinitum, right? On the negative numbers, negative one, negative two, negative three, you know, minus four, ad infinitum. Can you find, in either way of the number line, a beginning? <coughs> yeah, there's no beginning. You know, the square root of two, you never wind up settling exactly what it is. It just keeps going on and on and on and on. So, when people come and say, well, there has to be a beginning, but then I usually say, okay, please try and find it. <laughs> yeah? And if you can find it, then you know it exists. But if you can't find it, then you might want to begin thinking of countless previous lives and so on. Okay? So, it's very important as Westerners that we don't bring in Judeo-Christian ideas about the universe, about uh, cause and effect, heaven and hell and this kind of thing, that we don't bring that into our understanding of Buddhism. But rather, we leave the Judeo-Christian understanding there with the religions that have it, and we try and arrive with a fresh, open mind to understand the Buddhist approach and how the Buddha explained things. And that makes things much easier for us. Uh, you know, our mind is the creator. Yeah. So there's a verse uh, in the Dhammapada that says, Mind is the forerunner of all miserable states. It is the mind that leads the way. <clears throat> Just as the wheel of an ox cart <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> follows the hoof of the ox, so suffering will surely follow when we speak or act impulsively from an impure state of mind. So from a state of mind with ignorance, anger, attachment, other kinds of afflictions. Then the Dhammapada continues, Mind is the forerunner of all happy states. It is the mind that leads the way. Just as our shadow never leaves us, so well-being will surely follow when we speak or act from a pure state of mind. So from a state of mind that is free of ignorance, anger, and attachment. Um, when we wonder what is a definition of karma, the Buddha said, it is intention that I call karma. For having willed or having intended, one acts by body, speech, or mind. Okay. So we often talk about body, speech, and mind as the three doors uh, through which we act. Okay, And intention is what causes us to act. Our mouth doesn't move without there being an intention in the mind. Okay? We don't move to do an action without there being an intention in the mind. Okay? Of course, when the doctor hits, hits you here and your foot <laughs> moves, that's different. That's a different system of cause and effect. That's not karma. Okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just don't kick the doctor in the nose. <laughs> Okay, so when we talk about karma, there's general uh, characteristics of it. So there's four general characteristics. Let's see if we can move this so it stays on. <laughs> okay, so 
So the first characteristic is that karma is definite, okay? In that, happiness comes from previously created constructive actions, and suffering comes from previously creating destructive actions. So it never occurs the other way around. Okay? So it's not that, uh, you know, we can kill and steal and lie, and then somehow finagle it so that we have a happy result at the end of the, the day from that. that that's never going to happen. Yeah. And uh, so just as happiness <clears throat> cannot be produced by non-virtue, when we create virtue, it can never produce unhappiness. It always brings happiness. Okay. So that's the first uh, quality of karma. The second quality is that karma is expandable, in that a small action can bring a big result. Okay, so uh, it's nice. That I'll read some of these quotations from the sutras. You know, um, it's, it's good to hear them. Uh, so a small action can bring a big result. Like a poison that has been ingested, the commission of even a small negativity creates in your lives hereafter great danger and a terrible downfall. As when grain ripens into a bounty, even the creation as of small merit leads in lives hereafter to great happiness and will be immensely meaningful as well. Okay? So just as a small seed can grow a big tree, yeah. It's very interesting, you know, go outside and look at these enormous trees and then you think they all grew from a tiny, tiny seed. It's really kind of amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You think it's this itty bitty seed and now it's this enormous tree. So in the same way, you know, small actions can bring big results. So when we understand this, then we know to try and avoid even small negativities. So to not just, well, rationalize, well, it was just a little white lie, you know. Let's, you know, keep, keep things clean, yeah. And similarly, when we tend to be lazy about uh, doing even virtuous actions, to remember that it, it can be very powerful. So, for example, uh, setting up an altar and making offerings every morning. Even if you're half asleep, you know, it's still very virtuous to do that and to start the day off by thinking of your refuge. Okay, the third quality of karma. Um, we will not experience the effect of an action we have not done. Yeah, this one yeah, is very strong and... Uh, yeah, we need, well, I'll talk about that later. Okay. Um, in other words, when you see uh, people in a similar situation, but they experience different results from it, yeah, uh, when I think of, uh, you know, the Twin Towers in New York on 9-11, yeah, some people survived, some people died. Yeah, they were in the same situation. Yeah. So that indicates that they had created some collective similar karma to be in the same situation together. But they also had their individual karma because some people survived and some people didn't. Yeah. So we only experience the result of actions that we've created and we don't experience the results of actions that we did not create. Okay? You have to be sometimes, well, let me do the fourth quality first and then I'll get into that. The fourth quality is karmic seeds do not get lost or magically vanish. So they're not like your computer files. <laughs> okay? 
I it just, you know, got OneDrive, and, you know, some of my files are not being saved, and they're vanishing, and, you know, but karma is not like that. <laughs> yeah? Some of my karma, I wish, would vanish like my computer files. <laughs> but it doesn't happen that way, okay? However... Um, if we apply antidotes to the karma, then we can uh, stop it from ripening. So in the case of destructive karma, if we do purification with the four opponent powers, which we'll get into, uh, then it can either reduce the uh, effect or shorten it or uh, even stop it from ripening altogether. In the case of our virtuous karma, yeah, if we generate wrong views, if we get angry, that can impede the ripening of our virtuous karma. So we want to be really careful about this one. Okay. So this is an antidote that I often use when I get angry at somebody. Okay, Because I'm really mad. And my mind is going around, they did this and they did that, and how dare they, and you know, who are they treating me like this, and I need to get my revenge, and ah, nah, nah, nah. You know how it is when you get angry. Okay, there's like just this constant, you know, garbage rolling around in the mind. So I'll stop and I'll think, okay, children, you know, you're... Uh, ego is clearly getting something out of being angry at this person. You know, you feel really empowered to like tell them they're wrong and they can't do like this. Now, is impeding the ripening of your own good karma worth getting angry? Okay, because when I get angry, I'm going to impede the ripening of my own good karma. I'm going to destroy what I've worked hard to, to create. So I have to say, okay, you want to, con I say to myself, you want to continue being angry? Okay, go ahead. But your result is that you're shooting yourself in the foot by stopping your own virtuous karma from ripening, and you're going to experience suffering from this. So if you want to do that, fine, but think carefully. And that helps me calm down. Like, you know, it really isn't worth being angry at this person. Yeah, if that's the result of my anger, it's not worth it. Okay? Now, those are the general characteristics of karma. We have to be very careful who we talk about karma to and how we talk about karma. Okay? So I'll give you some examples where I made some boo-boos regarding this. Okay, do you remember many years ago when there was a, a Pan Am flight that was shot down over Lockerbie, uh, Scotland? And I, there were some students from a university in that um, plane. So this was many, many years ago. So I happened to be giving a talk, maybe some months after, a year after the plane was shot down, at that university. And so somebody raised their hand and said, well, how does karma relate to, uh, you know, these students from our university who are our friends and companions uh, getting killed? And so then I talked about, well, whenever we experience suffering, it's a result of our own non-virtue. Whoa, that was the wrong thing to say to a secular audience who didn't understand karma. Because they went, what? Are you telling us that our friends are bad people because they created non-virtue? That's not true. They were good people. Are you telling us that they deserve to die? Yeah? <laughs> so I learned. 
don't talk about karma that way to people who don't have the, the view of karma already established in their mind. So to clarify, no, we're not saying people deserve to die. Okay, absolutely not. It's just that, you know, when you plant chili pepper seeds in your garden and you put water and fertilizer on those chili pepper seeds, they're going to grow. Yeah, and they're going to produce chili peppers. They're not going to produce daisies. Okay? So chili peppers are just a reward, uh, just an effect of the, the chili pepper seeds. They aren't a reward, they aren't a punishment. Okay? Similarly, when you plant daisies, you get daisy seeds, you get daisies. Yeah, you don't get chili peppers. The daisies are just a result of the, the daisy seeds. They're not a reward, they're not a punishment. So nobody deserves to suffer. Okay, that's one thing that's very important to understand. Second thing is by saying that you know they these people died, so that indicates that there was a ripening of destructive karma created in the past. Yeah, and destructive karma is created by non-virtue. Yeah, that doesn't mean those people are non-virtuous. It doesn't mean they're wicked, evil people who deserve to suffer. It simply means that they did a mistaken action. Okay, and the action wasn't purified. Yeah, anybody here who's never done a mistaken action? Yeah. Are we evil people? No, we are complex human beings. Yeah. We have virtuous mental factors. We also have non-virtuous mental factors. We do virtuous actions, which leave positive, you know, the seeds of positive karma in our minds. We uh, have bad intentions sometimes and do, you know, destructive actions. Those leave the seeds of destructive karma in our mind streams. It's not that we're evil people. Not at all. In fact, everybody has the Buddha nature. See, we cannot ever, ever say that somebody is evil or that they deserve to suffer. Okay, this is very, very important. Those ideas come from the Judeo-Christian tradition. They are not Buddhist ideas. Okay, so we need to be really clear about that. Otherwise, we just get all tangled up. Okay? Yeah, people understand? Yeah. So, actually, this is another thing that's very important. When we see that the action and the person who does the action are two different things. Yeah. That means that we can say the action is harmful, but we can never say the person is evil. Okay. Which means that we cannot form an opinion of any living being based on their actions, give them the title evil and throw them out the window as being not worth, not a worthwhile living being. Okay? So even your worst enemy, the person you hate the most, has the Buddha potential. And that person can purify all their negativities just as we can purify all our negativities. So what use is it to hate somebody? How can we hate somebody that has the Buddha potential? 
So in the early years at Copan, you know, uh, Lamia, she would be teaching us, and the question often came up, you know, but Lama, what about Hitler? <laughs> what about Mao Zedong? What about Joseph Stalin? Yeah, aren't they evil? And Lama would always say, they means well, dear. <laughs> Okay, so this was how he spoke English, you know. <laughs> he called everybody dear, and he didn't know on uh, third, third person <laughs> verbs, uh, plural verbs, not to put an S. He would say, they means well, dear. Adolf Hitler meant well. Yeah. And then he'd, he'd say, well, he was kind to his family, wasn't he? Yeah. So, uh, you know, he it was very shocking to us, but he really emphasized that uh, we can't uh, put anybody in a category and leave them out. And when you really think about rebirth and the fact of how much we change from one life to the next, and the fact that in beginningless lives, they say, we've done everything. So that means, sorry to break it to you, that we've been our own little Hitlers in previous lifetimes. So we have a little bit to purify. Okay? But we have the Buddha potential, so we can purify. It also teaches us that we should never wish anybody harm because everybody has the Buddha nature. Yeah? Everybody has that potential. So when we get really mad at people and we say, may you go to hell, you know how we do that? Yeah? Do, you, do you say that sometimes? Never swear. <laughs> really? When you're really mad, you don't say, may you get hit at, by a truck as soon as possible. <laughs> Where's that truck? Well, I can't stand you. Hmm? Okay. When you read about ISIS uh, soldiers getting killed, do you say, oh, good. One less. Okay? We have to be very, very careful because thinking like that plants karmic seeds in our own mind stream. Yeah? And we may think that these actions are harmful and they are harmful and they are despicable, but the person is not despicable. Yeah? So we can't give up on anybody. So especially when we come to meditate on bodhicitta, you know, the first meditation we do is uh, equanimity, yeah? freeing our minds from attachment to friends, aversion to enemies, and apathy towards uh, strangers. Yeah? It's incredibly important to do that so that we can include all sentient beings when we generate bodhicitta. Because if we leave out even one sentient being, we cannot generate bodhicitta. If we don't generate bodhicitta, we cannot attain full awakening. So somehow or another, we have to deal with our anger and our hatred and our desire for revenge, which we don't like to admit that we have, but we're with friends. <laughs> we can admit it. We're all the same. Yeah. And it's only when we admit it can we then start to purify.
Now we get into the next section is um, the specific characteristics of karma. So uh, in one of the sutras, he uh, said, the Buddha said, let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay. He, the Buddha said, what is uh, destructive? The destruction of life. So that's the first of the ten non-virtuous paths of action. Killing. Taking what is not given. That's often translated as stealing. But with stealing, we think that means you put on a mask and break into somebody's house in the middle of the night. And we don't do that. But do you use your company's resources for your own personal uh, activities? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Do you uh, take your uh, friends out to dinner and then put it on the company's expense account? Yeah. Do you uh, uh, not? Do you kind of alter a little bit the figures on your income tax, or avoid paying fees and that you should pay? I know you people don't do that. That's other people <laughs> don't do that. Not you. But just you know, just think about it. Okay, then next one, unwise and un, you know, unwise and unkind sexual conduct. Okay. This is the one that Westerners go bananas over. You know, people, oh boy, they all wake up. And it's like, what? What are you talking about? So the principal thing here is adultery, if you're in a relationship going with somebody else or even if you're not in a relationship going with somebody who is, you know. And we have gazillions of rationalizations for this. The chief being, but my partner will never find out. And the children will never know. And it satisfies me and it makes me happy, so what's wrong? Because this is real love. Well, I can't tell you the number of people who come to me who say, you know, when I was a kid, I knew that my dad, it was usually dad, sometimes moms, um, I knew that one of my parents was having an affair. Yeah. So you think your kids don't find out? Kids are smart. Okay. So what this, the chief thing is adultery, but it also includes, yeah, the unwise part is uh, not using <clears throat> methods to prevent the spread of STDs, you know. So if you're infected with something, use precautions so you don't spread disease to somebody else. Talk with your partner first, you know, and if they have something, make sure they, you know, that you, that you use uh, some kind of preventive methods so that um, sexual diseases are not transmitted. Also included in unwise uh, and unkind sexual behavior is just using people for our own gratification. Yeah. So, um, you know, this is where the young people go really crazy. And some of the old people too. Uh, but because they say, well, but, but what about hooking up? You know, everybody is hooking up now, you know, you just have a sexual relationship and it feels good and you go on to the next one and nobody is emotionally involved. Oh yeah? Really? Yeah. So, having relationships, you may think, well nobody else, you know, your partner isn't getting emotionally involved, but maybe they are. And then when you move on to the next person, they're hurt, and they feel used, and they feel betrayed. Okay? So that's also very important, you know, not to hurt others, either physically or emotionally, through how we use sexuality. Okay? 
So you're all going to go home and tell your kids now, right? <laughs> yeah. She said, you shouldn't do that. But she said, you shouldn't do that. I'm different. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the Buddha said, you know, what is uh, negative? The destruction of life, taking what is not given, unwise and unkind sexual behavior. Those are the three um, physical ones. Then he said false speech, so lying, okay, altering the truth uh, for our own benefit. Yeah. So this doesn't mean when somebody comes, a hunter comes and says, where did the deer go? You say right over there so he can go kill the deer. We're not talking about that. Clearly, you aren't going to tell the hunter where the deer is. But it does mean cleaning up our speech and not altering things to uh, just kind of cover up things that we did for the benefit of others because it might hurt them if they knew what I really did. Okay? So we lie. Yeah. We lie for, uh, to get advantage. Yeah. We lie to make ourselves look good. Uh, what happens when you go for a job interview? Do you tell the truth in your job interviews? No. You know? When I talk to some people, they'll say, but if I do, I'll never get the job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? So you always say, you know, when people, uh, we have an application form when people want to come to the Abbey. So we ask them what skills they have, to, just so that we know well, when it's offering service time, what kind of things that they can do and, you know, would enjoy doing. And some people say, oh, I'm a very quick learner. Okay, that is code for I don't know anything. <laughs> okay. But, you know, we understand what they mean. You know, we, nobody wants to say, I don't know how to do any of these things. So we say, I'm a very quick learner. But sometimes when you're going for a job interview, you know, it's like, well, you probably know better than I do. I don't go, I don't work. <laughs> yeah, I've been unemployed since my 20s. Yeah. And I've never starved. Isn't that amazing? And I've never, uh, you know, collected welfare, but never starved. Okay, so lying, divisive speech, yeah? dividing people who are friends, saying bad things behind people's backs so that people don't like each other. Yeah, this happens in offices all the time. Okay, it also happens at Dharma centers. <laughs> Oops, I wasn't supposed to say that. But it's true. Yeah. Because we all want to get, gain favor with the teacher. Yeah. So we kind of, you know, well, that person's not so good, and that person's not so good. But I'm a very good Dharma student. Yeah, so I should get to sit in the front row. And the teacher should pay more attention to me, because I'm so good. And then somebody else comes along and says, Oh, look, here's a picture of, uh, you know, the llama uh, with me. <laughs> yeah, look at this beautiful picture of me and Rupache. Isn't it nice? And he even signed it, you know, and dedicated it to me. Uh, do you have a picture like that? <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry you don't. <laughs> or I got to drive the teacher around. The teacher was in my car. Yeah. Was, did the teacher ride in your car? 
Oh, I'm sorry. You just have an old beat-up vehicle. You don't have a really nice one like me. Yeah. I got to try to teach her around. <laughs> okay? So we, we do stuff like that, don't we? Secrets of the Dharma Center. <laughs> <laughs> True confession of what goes on in a Dharma Center. <laughs> you know, we're sentient beings. Okay? Oh, I'll tell you some more stuff. <laughs> when, when I lived in Italy, um, this was many years ago, so I've, I've subsequently uh, kind of gotten better. But uh, when I lived in Italy, yeah, the llamas had a little villetta at the Dharma Center. And then all the students ate at the main kitchen. So, uh, you know, I had to compete with all the other people who wanted to be the cook for the llamas. Okay. So you got to compete with them to get in there, and I'm going to cook breakfast, and, you know, yeah. Remember Che asked me to make a cup of tea. He asked me to make the tea. Yeah, get out of here. Yeah, I'm making the tea. I don't care if you're the person who's designated as the, as the cook. He asked me to make the tea. Yeah. Or, you know, I'll, I'll come in, you know, in, in the Valletta, the llama's dishes? Do you need somebody to wash the llama's dishes? I'll volunteer. I'll go wash the llama's dishes. You know, the llama's di dirty dishes are so precious. Somehow, I want to be the person who washes them. Yeah. But other sentient beings, the students at the Dharma Center, I never volunteer to go wash their dirty dishes. You know? I'll compete with others to wash the llama's dirty dishes. I don't want to wash your dirty dishes. You go wash your own dirty dishes, and you can actually wash mine, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So this, you know, this kind of, we compete. We compete. And then in the process of competition, we kind of diss other people to make ourselves look good. Hmm. Maybe I better stop the stories. <laughs> You'll lose all your faith. <laughs> okay, so divis uh, Okay, false speech. These are the four of speech. False speech, divisive speech, harsh speech. Yeah, telling people off criticizing them to their face, insulting them, ridiculing them, teasing kids, making kids afraid. Okay. I, I know, again, none of you do things like that. You know, we're always nice and polite with other people, even though they're so obnoxious. You know, we never shout and scream, you know, not even at your kids when they're throwing stuff. Um, you know, oh, well, maybe sometimes there's some harsh speech, huh? And uh, who do we direct our harsh speech most towards? Ourselves. Ourselves. Okay. After ourselves? Those closest to us. Huh? Those who are closest to the us. The people who are closest to us. Isn't that strange? Mm -hmm. The people you love the most, mm -hmm. who you depend on the most, are the people who you say the most horrible, egregious things to. Not strangers. Yeah. Even the guy who dents your car, you would never talk to them the way you talk to a loved one. Isn't that odd? Mm -hmm. Yeah? And then we wonder why trust, which is built up for over a long period of time, uh, is so easily shattered. Mm -hmm. <coughs> OK. 
Okay, so it's very important that, that with the people we live with, that we care the most about, that we really wash our speech most with them. Yeah. And also at the office, wherever, wherever you work, factory, workplace, you know, don't create cliques by everybody getting together and gossiping about this person over here and blaming them for everything that's wrong. That happens, ooh, sometimes at Dharma centers, no, I'm not going to say that. But it does, you know. It's just this is what human beings do. How do we feel good about ourselves? We get together and we diss somebody else. And the conclusion of the discussion is, we are the best people in the world. Okay. But this is not virtuous speech. <laughs> okay. This is harsh speech. Yeah, very damaging. And we've all been the victim of other people's harsh speech, haven't we? Yeah. So remembering what it, it feels like to be the recipient of it, then let's take care not to dish it out to other people. And then the fourth non-virtue of speech is idle talk. Blah, 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 okay, on and on about nothing to make ourselves look good and pass time, okay. Remember when we used to use telephones and you would be on the telephone with somebody who would not stop talking? <laughs> and you needed to do something else, and you were trying to find some way to get off the phone. Yeah. So now people don't use phones, so you text, or you send little verbal messages to people, but that way you don't have to engage with them in live things, so you don't have to be subjected to their blah blah. But you also don't have human connections. We give up the human connections with other people. Okay. So, but I suppose people can go on and on in a text, can't you? You know, you keep texting somebody again and again. Like, like President Trump. He tweets and then he sends another tweet and then he sends another tweet and another tweet. You know, he's, he's only... It's, they lifted the... I don't do Twitter. But I think they lifted the number of characters you can have now. So he goes all the way to the end and then puts dot, 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 and then does another tweet. Okay? And on and on and on, even if you don't want to hear what this guy's saying. Yeah? I should be a patriotic American. <laughs> I am patriotic. But I don't like the president. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is what it means in a, to live in a free country, isn't it? Is that you can say that, and nobody's going to come and arrest you for saying it. You know, and that's why it's so important to preserve our freedom. I like President Obama. Yeah, he was really good. But like I told some other people the other day, I think Angela Merkel should run for president of the U.S. She's really good, isn't she? You know, the Chancellor of Germany? She's really good. Okay. We want Jacinda Ardern. Yes. Huh? Here in Australia, we want the New Zealand Prime Minister. Oh, yeah, she's really good too, isn't she? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, but they're sentient beings who have Buddha nature. We got to remember, don't just gang up and badmouth them. The world's resources, because it's good for the economy if we buy more. Okay, so coveting, maliciousness. This one we do, you know. There, you really thinking about that person said this to me. Then they said that I can't stand the way they talk to me. I've got to say something to them to let them know what's going on. And we can spend a whole meditation session doing this. 
<laughs> yeah, have you ever done that? <laughs> yeah? Okay. I take refuge in the Buddha's Dharma and the Sangha until I attain awakening and will generate bodhicitta. Fifteen years ago, my brother did this. Ooh. My opinion on <laughs> And then my brother did that, and my sister agreed with him and not me. I've got to put an end to this. I'm the victim of their bad speech. Oh, my And then you hear. Oh. It's time to dedicate the <laughs> merit. <laughs> what merit? <laughs> I spent my whole meditation sense grumbling about what people have done to me. <clears throat> okay, that's called maliciousness. That's the third mental non-virtue. And the, uh, uh, the second one. And the third uh, mental non-virtue is wrong views. So this is like saying uh, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha don't exist. Uh, there's no uh, law of cause and effect. In other words, my actions have bring no results. <laughs> yeah, I can do whatever I want as long as I don't get caught. There's no such thing as karmic results. I just have to, you know, prevent the, the government from finding out what I'm doing and arrest me. But aside from that, I'll do whatever I want. Okay, that's quite a big wrong view. Okay? So then the Buddha went on. And what is virtuous? Abstinence from the destruction of life. Abstinence from taking what is not given. Abstinence from unwise and unkind sexual conduct. Abstinence from false speech. Abstinence from divisive speech. Abstinence from harsh speech. Abstinence from idle talk. And similarly, abstinence from covetousness, um, malice, and wrong views. In other words, having uh, non-covetousness, goodwill, and correct views. Okay. So just the stopping of the non-virtuous actions, just not doing it when you could, is a virtuous action. Okay? Doing the opposite of the non-virtues, such as protecting life, protecting others' property, and so on, then those are also virtuous things. But just not doing the non-virtue is something virtuous. So that's why uh, we take precepts. Yeah, uh, in terms of lay people, you take the five precepts to abandon killing, stealing, <clears throat> unwise and unkind sexual behavior, lying, and intoxicants. Yeah, and uh, then that means that every if you've taken those precepts, every minute that you're not breaking them, you're accumulating virtue. So two people could be sitting here. Nobody's killing right now, I hope. <laughs> yeah. One person has the precepts not to kill, and they're just sitting here. They're automatically creating virtue because they're keeping their precept. The person who, who doesn't have the precept is also not killing, but because they don't have that precept, that intention in their mind not to kill, they aren't accumulating the merit of abstaining from killing at this moment. So when you take and keep precepts, it's very, very powerful karmically to help you create merit and to purify previously created non-virtue. Okay, so that's talking about the specific characteristics of karma. Now, and, and then there's a whole bunch in the in the book about, you know, exactly how you can uh, 
do these, all the different factors, to have a full, um, a full non-virtue, all the different factors, you know, from your motivation to the action, the conclusion of the action, and so on, of how to do these uh, so that you create virtue, you know, for, so for the ten <coughs> virtues, the ten non-virtues. So that's all in the book. I won't go through that now because there's other things. But first, we're going to take a break. Okay? So, how about if we take a 20-minute break and come back at 12.06. <laughs> Not 12.07. Okay. And then we'll continue on from there. Okay?